for this. Uh, up next, we have Martin Harper from BirdLife International. Um, thank you, Martin. So I stay back in the background to make sure that Vasil really keeps stuff is funny. Yeah, you can stay in the background. Um, yeah. Firstly, uh, I'm feeling both um, inspired and also a bit old standing here in front of many of you today because um, it was 27 years ago that um, dear old Craig and myself did the Masters. I can see Tony Juniper, I know he's a bit older and he did it before I did, but it has just been absolutely fantastic to see all of these stories of all of these alumni going out into the world and trying to do their bit. So I'm going to talk to you with a friend called Vasiliki over the next quarter of an hour about how UCL has helped me uh, and indeed how it's helped the BirdLife family, which I've been a part of for, gosh, nearly 20 years, um, play its part in this incredible challenge of saving the planet. So, um, a little bit about me. Well, look, um, the first thing I did at UCL was I made mates with Craig and I learned how to ride a horse. Here we are in Mongolia. Uh, and uh, we had a fantastic time. And as I was thinking about this, in that, I'm a little bit ahead there, Craig, by the way. Um, the thing is, there's a metaphor here for, I think, conservation careers, which is, if you can stay on the ride, it's going to be quite a bumpy ride. You end up in really interesting places. Uh, and as you've heard from the amazing little the talks we've had and the little box box, you end up in really interesting places. And, you know, I sort of let my career horse go wherever it wanted to. As you say, but neither of us really had control of those horses. Um, but I think the other thing about UCL, what it did for me when I did conservation course, was it just revealed the world of conservation. I didn't have a clue when I joined, really. How was I going to have a career? I had no idea. And it just exposed me to brilliant people doing great things. And I thought, OK, I'll give it a go. Oh, so that's is roughly my career to date. So I started by doing a very theoretical biological science courses at Oxford, went to UCL and said, wow, you can do conservation. And then I ended up working for a bunch of NGOs, Wildlife Conservation Link UK, I was conservation director of plant life for five years. And then I had a number of jobs at RSBB, the Royal Society of Protection of Birds, ended up being the conservation director uh, for 10 years. And, um, and then back in the middle of lockdown, I thought I'd get a new job. Uh, so I moved to the other end of my kitchen table and I became the regional director for BirdLife in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, so those of you who don't know BirdLife, uh, we are the largest and oldest civil society partnership for conservation around the world. And the one at the bottom with a little ring around it is dear old RSPB, which happens to be the UK partner. So there's 117 independent organisations around the world all working together trying to save nature and people. Uh, and it's been a wonderful family to be part of for so long. And my current role is to try and lead 41 partners, three affiliates and four candidate partners in the Europe and Central Asia region. Uh, and when I started, I knew it would be a challenging job. Uh, um, you know, I'm a UK citizen working for an organisation, 27 of which is still part of the European Union. Um, but I didn't expect what was going to happen in the East and the Russian invasion of Ukraine and indeed the change in mood which has led, for example, to the loss of our partner in Belarus because Lukashenko has been shutting down civil society organisations. Um, but it is, it's been, um, I have just, I'm learning every day in this role partly because great people across the whole of the partnership. Uh, very simply, the BirdLife mission is really about saving nature for people and for its own sake, but it's rooted in two principles. The partnership, the strength of those 117 organisations, all independent, and also science, uh, trying to find solutions to 21st century problems. And then we engage in species and sites, trying to change the system, trying to mobilise society, and we do it through the medium, really, of birth. That's really the, um, I suppose the beacon for, for nature that we try and, we try and work with. Uh, and that unites us, and that's what we've been trying to do. And um, so what have I learned since 1995? Well, there's loads of things. Uh, and I agree with Tom. I love Tom's, port, uh, Tom's talk. I agree with the need for public pressure. And I've been part of that, attempts to try and put pressure on the public. But actually, the key thing I've really learned is that conservation is not just about monitoring decline. And honestly, we do that. We've done that a lot. We do red lists. We do species um, site assessments. And we've been showing massive declines. But it's not just about that. As you've been hearing from talks from around the world this afternoon, 
people are making the world better and improving the natural world. And my belief is that telling these positive stories inspires action from others. Um, so I am a bit of a disciple of the earth and conservation optimism movement. I, I think that in a way that's how you get more people inspired to do, play their part. And most of the stories that I've been listening to this afternoon have been positive, um, even against the backdrop of enormous decline. And I think that is a massive energizer. And I've been really lucky enough to be involved in some fantastic conservation programs um, in my time, particularly at the RSPB and now BirdLife. Uh, and I'm going to give four tiny examples um, before I hand over to Vasiliki. Uh, and so, you know, gyps vultures, massive declines in Asia, um, detected in the late 90s, um, identifying diclofenac use in cattle, which was toxic to vultures. And through science, we, we identified that, had to campaign to get rid of diclofenac, essentially from the whole cattle system, veterinary system. And we're beginning to see the uptick in Asian vulture populations and begin to basically create vulture safe zones where these amazing creatures can fly free from harm. Uh, and that started in the late 90s and people are still giving it a go today. Um, albatrosses, uh, when we started back in 2004, uh, 17 out of 22 species of albatrosses were declining, principally because of bycatch from longline fishing where 300,000 birds were being killed each year. And so we had to learn how to um, respond to that challenge by pretty much getting on board vessels with fishermen to teach them how to catch fish again, rather than birds which were basically drowning when they caught the baits um, as they have been put out uh, at the back of a vessel. Um, but because of those efforts, we've been able to reduce the incidence of bycatch in some of the fishing fleets in South Africa, in Namibia, in Argentina, to dramatic levels. And so we're beginning to see even some of our albatross populations having a little bit of an uptick. Um, the bittern story, very close to the heart of the RSPB, um, it, its story is simple. It reduced massively in terms of its population to its uh, nadir back in uh, mid-1990s, only nine booming males. And then a concerted program of habitat restoration, particularly its habitat for rebeds, um, enormous amount of work with other organisations, led to the booming bittern population getting up to more than 200 or so today. Huge amount of effort, again, over, over a 10, 20 year period. And then this place, which is incredibly close to my heart, this is Gola Rainforest, which straddles um, go, um, Sierra Leone and Liberia, uh, where um, the RSPB, BirdLife, our partners on the ground, have been working to try and keep this incredible remnant of the Upper Guinean forest intact. Uh, and we've been there for over 30 years. And through a combination of creating in infrastructure where the local community, the government, the NGOs are together, we're trying to find a way to keep it protected. The local people love it, they cherish it, and we're finding new ways to try and um, create um, commercial activities which benefit um, this incredible forest. So, um, conservation optimism works for me, and I think it works for many, um, but also in terms of the, the real lessons for some of these really big projects, I think can be applied to pretty much any of the stories that we've heard. To my mind, science drives action. Uh, and it's not just natural science, it is also social science. Uh, change takes time. Um, uh, those of you who've been involved in conservation, you don't get these big changes overnight. And so you've got to stick at it. Uh, all of the stories I've just told, all of them have taken place over more than two decades. Uh, none, nothing, none of what we've, I've ever done has been outside of coalitions. I've always collaborated, and all of these conservation projects, which you can... Google about, have all involved big coalitions to try and get things done. Uh, most of the time, you need the law to be on your side, so you either campaign to get it, or when you get it, you've got to enforce it. And then just make sure you keep doing the nuts and bolts of, of science, good project planning. You monitor, you report, you evaluate, and you adapt, and you learn. Uh, and in the end, what you need to have is passionate, determined people at the heart, and I've been privileged to work with loads of them and also to work with this wonderful person, Vasiliki, who's from our partner in BirdLife Cyprus, who's now going to take the floor, and I'm going to come back at the end. My name is Vasiliki, and I come from Cyprus. I graduated from UCL in 2010, where I received my master's in conservation. 
I returned to the island after I finished my studies and I was really lucky to quickly find my place at Bird Life Science. It is the most active conservation NGO on the island. Its mission is to protect wild birds, their habitats, and wider biodiversity. More importantly, it is the national partner of Bird Life International in Cyprus, which is an umbrella organization for conservation across the globe. This partnership works great in many ways. For a small organization like Bird Life Cyprus, it means it can look to other NGOs across the world to get guidance, exchange ideas, or even collaborate. This collaboration had great successes in Cyprus in many occasions. Probably the biggest success with the most stunning results has been the collaboration between BirdLife Cyprus and the RSPP in their campaign against illegal trapping of migratory songbirds in Cyprus. Illegal trapping of birds using lime sticks, mist nets, and tape lures is a widespread and very serious problem that the Cypriot nature is facing. It is not selective, which means it does not discriminate between bird species. It is, of course, illegal, it is cruel, and it is sadly large scale. On record years recently, an estimate of two and a half million birds have been trapped in Cyprus. This amounts to an ecological catastrophe. Our collaboration with the RSPB celebrates 20 years this year. For 20 years, Bird Life Cyprus, together with the RSPB, have been monitoring the levels of trapping in Cyprus, have been campaigning and putting pressure on every possible level and trying to change public perception of this very important issue. The UK angle on this issue is particularly important. This is because what used to be the trapping black spot on the island was situated within the sovereign British base areas, which made it a UK overseas territory issue. After years or probably decades of campaigning, the situation is now reversed in the British bases. We have seen massive reduction of bread trapping in these areas. This is due to close collaboration between the Southern British Base Area Police and NGOs including the RSPB. What we have also seen is a glimmer of hope that trapping is an issue that could be solved given the appropriate approach and political will. And if trapping the British bases can be solved, then why not trapping in other areas of the island or other major conservation issues that Cyprus is facing? One of them, and one of the most serious issues, is the loss of habitat, its fragmentation, and its degradation all over the island. This is the area of work of Berlin Cyprus that I personally focus on most of my time. Land is finite, and on a Mediterranean island like Cyprus, this is also precious with all the meanings that this word has. It is therefore an uphill battle to keep even protected areas protected. Frankly, on many days, it feels like a battle that has been lost, especially when you see important areas or birds being turned into marinas, golf courses, hotels, or highways. It only takes a few victories, every couple of losses, to personally keep me going and the organization in general. The massive success of the reduction of illegal bird trapping in the British places is one of the success that keep us going. Another one is the incredible success of the restoration of Orokini Lake. Orokini Lake was an area that greatly suffered from degradation to the extent that a flea market was operating in the middle of it. After a restoration project, we can now see the area completely changed and even black and still successfully breathing. These are a few of the examples of victories that make this everyday battle worth it, as well as the feeling that you have a whole umbrella organization to turn to for all the knowledge and support. I guess the most important currency of this is passion. Advocating for nature is not another thing it will ever be an easy task for anyone. This is because the benefits of preserving nature require a long-term vision that often politicians, government officials, entrepreneurs, or even the public 
lag, and all this gets lost behind the promises of strife and gain. My hope is that all this passion of the young generation has, and everyone who works in conservation has, will shift the narrative, and that my daughter's generation will be the generation of restoration. Perseverance is the only thing that ever changed the world, and this world is changing ASAP with climate change having already arrived. So uh, Vasiliki is an absolute star. She's a, one of a team of only about 14 or 15 on an island. I used to work for the RSPB with 2,000 staff. So um, she's at the front line of conservation. She's delivering great results. It's a privilege to call her a colleague. Um, so look, just three final slides just to give you some thoughts about the future. So Vasiliki you know, talked about the fact they're entering this you know, UN decade on ecosystem restoration uh, and the back.